He worked for 15 years as an insect ecologist at the University of Wyoming, publishing over 100 scientific papers and pioneering a method for controlling rangeland grasshoppers. In 2003, he himself metamorphosed into a professor of natural sciences and humanities in the Department of Philosophy. He's a scientist philosopher, and he's also a creative writer. He's in the program in creative writing where he teaches environmental ethics, the philosophy of ecology, and nature slash environmental writing. He currently directs the University of Wyoming's outstanding MFA program in creative writing that brings in fabulous writers to this town every single year and come and listen to them read and meet them when you get the chance. He's published a ton of environmental spiritual essays. He's published books including local Focused the devastating rise and mysterious disappearance of the insect that shaped the American frontier. He's published Six-Legged Soldiers Using Insects as a Weapon of War. He's published Philosophical Foundations for the Practices of Ecology and The Infested Mind, Why Humans Fear, Loathe, and Love Insects which I will have to read to find out why humans love insects, because I do deeply understand why they fear and loathe them, but I don't understand why they love them. Um, but Jeff does, and his work has been honored with a Pushcart Prize, the John Burroughs Award, and inclusion in the best American science and nature writing. Some of his titles are long, but today's title is short. Welcome Jeff Lockwood, who's gonna talk to us on metamorphosis. I was about 10 when I saw a photograph of street urchins. I think it was in New York, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that one kid looked directly into the lens. It matters that the year was 1908. I somehow remember this detail. And it matters that the kid would have been 80 by the time I saw the image. To me, 80 was old, essentially dead. I realized that I was going to grow old. That kid had his picture in a book, but his pals had died anonymously. I didn't want to die without having mattered. Things were easier in the 1960s. Sure, there were riots, Vietnam, and the possibility of Armageddon, but at least I understood that boys studied science. The only question was what kind of scientist to become. My dad was a physicist, but I liked animals, so I wanted to be a veterinarian. Not a scientist, but close enough. I worked at a clinic, but became disillusioned. Insects, however, were darkly enchanting. You could make genuine discoveries, and entomology was pretty funky for a science. But now I write essays and stories about insects. It's not like being a real artist, but it's close enough. You know, the fights in academia are so intense because the stakes are so low. <laughs> I, I like to ask graduate students during their defensives, what if your conclusions are completely wrong? Usually, a few scholars would be miffed. And by the time anyone figured it out, the student would be gainfully employed because nobody actually repeats scientific experiments. This is why I gravitated to agriculture and pest management. Now, the sophisticates scorned applied research. The less connected to money, dirt, and poisons, the better. The science can be like performing CPR on a dummy. I wanted my work to matter, so that if I was wrong, real people would be really upset. I conducted field experiments with insecticides and biological agents. Having 22.4 grasshoppers per square yard before treatment and 4.6 afterward meant 79.5% control. The data told the unambiguous truth. So on a standard treatment program of 10,000 acres, there would be 861,520,000 fewer grasshoppers. The numbers were clean and precise until I began to wonder what that many deaths meant. I could answer how many grasshoppers will die, but I could not answer what does a living creature mean. Science is objective and value-free, well, except when one's identity is at stake, which is to say never. If you spend enough time with another living being, you eventually fall in love. For a while, things worked out because killing should be done by someone who cares. Good hunters will understand. But killing becomes harder with time. 
I switched to gentler studies, developing mathematical models of population dynamics, which about 10 people in the world understood. <laughs> and I discovered bits of grasshopper ecology, which about five people found interesting. <laughs> then I began writing and philosophizing about the natural world, which honored landscapes and creatures. People read what I wrote, and it mattered to them. So what I do now is even harder than science in many ways. I wrote about the infamous Rocky Mountain locust, entomological warfare, how insects have infested our psyches, what it meant to kill millions of creatures, and why I prayed before grasshopper control programs. I think that I was maybe building confidence for my current project, a book about how the energy industry has censored science, art, and education in Wyoming. But the lessons and warnings in that book apply to anywhere. Well, at least to anywhere that wealth and power catalyze injustice, which is pretty much everywhere, the book will make some powerful people mad. To be honest, I'm mad and a little bit worried. I empathize with Sisyphus, perpetually shoving that boulder up a hill and watching it roll back down. I wanted my life to matter. So I tried shoving the boulders of sustainability, ethics, and justice. But staking our happiness on consequences is a mistake. We must attend to our calling and make meaning from our lives by living authentically. For then our lives will matter to us. And maybe that's all we can ask. Thank you. <laughs>